Well, again, we're going to be in Genesis chapter 33, and I'm preaching a message I've entitled, Reunited and It Feels So Good. Now, those of you who are around in the late 1970s, you recognize that title as being the hit soul song by the vocal duo Peaches and Herb. Peaches and Herb. Now, I didn't know until I did a real research on Peaches and Herb this week that Herb fame, the Herb of Peaches and Herb, was the consistent male vocalist of the male-female vocal group. But throughout the history of Peaches and Herb, which also had the big hint, hit Shake Your Groove thing, that's not going to be the title of a sermon, by the way, <laughs> that there were seven different peaches in the group, which kind of makes the song Reunited not so special, right? <laughs> He went through seven different ladies in his time singing. But as we come to this text, I thought it was appropriate because of what we're going to see happen. And how more appropriate that on this Sunday, launch Sunday, our small groups are reuniting and it feels so good. Now, I didn't plan that. This is just how it landed. What we have in our passage today is these twin brothers, Jacob and Esau, separated for over 20 years. Now coming back together again for the first time, face to face. And remember the setup to this encounter in chapter 33. Jacob was told by God as he's in Mesopotamia in the north, return with your wives and your children and your herds to the land of promise, to the land of Canaan. And so Jacob obeyed the Lord and he got up and he took the wives and the children and the herds and the possessions 500 mile journey from Mesopotamia down south towards the promised land. But he takes an intentional detour. He goes out of his way towards the promised land, down to the land of Seir, to the country of Edom. Why? Because that's where Esau lives. And this estranged relationship, this estranged brother was there. And he knew before I can go on my journey to the promised land and fulfill God's promises, I must make things right with Esau. Now, last week, this brother that he had cheated, this brother that he had swindled out of a blessing, he sent a servant on ahead to tell Esau he was coming. And when this servant came back to Jacob, the servant simply said this, Esau's coming with 400 men. Now, that's a little ominous. 400 men, the, the standard size of a military army, of a militia. He's coming. So how does Jacob respond? Well, he takes his entourage and he divides them into two camps, thinking, well, if Esau attacks and kills this half, well, at least the other half will live. Further, he decides to give Esau five extravagant gifts. And so there are five droves of animals he sends ahead of him with space between that are all gifts, lavish gifts, hoping to appease the anger and vengeance of his brother. And that's kind of the cliffhanger we were left with last week. What's going to happen when these two get together? Well, it just so happens they're reunited and it feels so good. Well, let's look at the text. We're going to read the entire chapter of chapter 33 so that we can get the full flow of the narrative and then we'll consider what's being communicated in the passage for us today. The Bible says this, And Jacob lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, Esau was coming, and 400 men with him. So he divided the children among Leah and Rachel and the two female servants, and he put the servants with their children in front, then Leah with her children, and Rachel and Joseph last of all. He himself went on before them, bowing himself to the ground seven times until he came near to his brother. But Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him, and they wept. And when Esau lifted up his eyes and saw the women and children, he said, Who are these with you? Jacob said, The children whom God has graciously given your servant. Then the servants drew near, they and their children, and bowed down. Leah likewise and her children drew near and bowed down. And last, Joseph and Rachel drew, drew near, and they bowed down. Esau said, what do you mean by all this company that I met? Jacob answered, to find favor in the sight of my Lord. But Esau said, I have enough, my brother. Keep what you have for yourself. Jacob said, no, please. If I found favor in your sight, then accept my present from my hand. For I've seen your face, 
which is like seeing the face of God, and you've accepted me. Please accept my blessing that is brought to you because God has dealt graciously with me and because I have enough. Thus he urged him, and he took it. Verse 12, then Esau said, let us journey on our way, and I will go ahead of you. But Jacob said to him, my Lord knows that the children are frail and that the nursing flocks and herds are a care to me. If they are driven hard for one day, all the flocks will die. Let my Lord pass on ahead of his servant, and I will lead on slowly at the pace of the livestock that are ahead of me and at the pace of the children until I come to my Lord in Seir. So Esau said, well, let me leave with you some of the people who are with me. But he said, what need is there? Let me find favor in the sight of my Lord. So Esau returned that day on his way to Seir, but Jacob journeyed to Succoth and built himself a house and made booths for his livestock. Therefore, the name of the place is called Succoth. And Jacob came safely to the city of Shechem, which is in the land of Canaan, on his way from Padan Haram. And he camped before the city. And from the sons of Hamor, Shechem's, Shechem's father, he bought for a hundred pieces of money the piece of land on which he had pitched his tent. There he erected an altar and called it El Elohi Israel. Now the Bible commentators that I read in preparation for this message are virtually divided right down the middle on the way they interpret the interaction between Jacob and Esau. About half of them see this as these two brothers still managing and still manipulating, still conniving and still trying to work angles on each other. They see them as, as Jacob here and Esau. Yeah, yeah, they're just saying that. But what they really mean behind those words is this. In a word, they're cynical. They're cynical. Here's how the dictionary defines the word cynical. Look at the next slide. Distrusting or disparaging the motives of others. Bitterly or sneeringly distrustful, contemptuous, or pessimistic. Is there another word that so aptly describes the world we're in today than this word? Cynical? We are a cynical culture. We distrust and we disparage the motives of everyone. Anybody says anything, anybody does anything. Our culture thinks oh, there's an ulterior motive behind this. There's another angle they're trying to work. But as believers in Christ, we have another ethic that should describe us than cynical. We're commanded to interpret the world through the grid of agape love. The greatest description of, of Christian love, of agape love, is what the Apostle Paul shared in 1 Corinthians 13. Look at part of that chapter with me. In verse 4, he says this about the love and the lens through which we are to interpret the world. He says, love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoings, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Friends, looking through the lens of love would lead some to think, well, that's just a blind idealism. You're just blindly looking through this jaded lens of love and you don't really interpret things accurately. Some would say, well, the other side of the balance there is this pessimistic cynicism that you see ulterior motives in every person. So it's not these two, blind idealism and pessimistic cynicism. What does it mean to look through the eyes of love? I could be a song, couldn't it? What does it mean to look through the lens of love? And here's how I'd describe it with these two words, hopeful realism. Hopeful realism. We're realists. We realize people are lost. We realize people are sinful by nature. But looking through love is hopeful. It's exactly what Paul says, that we bear all things, believe all things, hope all things, endure all things. Friends, even non-Christians still bear on their bodies the mark of their creator. Non-believers are capable of doing good and virtuous acts. So we believe all things and hope all things. So that's how I'm going to approach this text. Looking at Jacob and looking at 
Esau with this hopeful realism. I'm going to believe the best in him. Because there's really, as, as you read the passage with a straightforward reading, there's no reason to land on such a negative interpretation of their motives. It's just simply two brothers joyously reuniting. And I want you to remember the immediate context of this passage. The immediate context at the end of chapter 32 is this, Jacob wrestling all night with God. And it was there in that wrestling match that the Lord Jesus, this Christophany, this pre-incarnate manifestation of the second person of the Trinity, touched Jacob's hip and broke him there. Jacob was broken before Jesus. And coming out of that brokenness, now he seeks to mend the relationships. There's really three things from this passage I want to point out in this reunification of these two brothers, and I think they're instructive for us. First of all, I want us to consider brothers reconciled. Brothers reconciled. For Jacob, it was a spiritual necessity before he entered the promised land, before he began to experience the promises God had given to the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, it was a spiritual necessity for there to be reconciliation with his estranged brother. But before Jacob could be reconciled to his brother, he first had to be reconciled to God. And that's what happens at the end of chapter 32. Before Jacob could come clean with Esau, he had to come clean before the Lord. And there's a principle here for us. Before our horizontal relationships will be mended, first we must mend the vertical relationship. We must be sure that our relationship with God is restored. He had to be humbled by God before he would be humble before his offended brother. Now, the Lord gave Jacob in that wrestling match both a new name and a new limp. He went from grasping to leaning. Now, as we'll see towards the end of this chapter and in the weeks to come, there are still some iterations and some indications of his old nature of Jacob coming through. But here in the wrestling match, Jacob received transforming, tenacious, one-sided grace from God. God blessed him there. Now, I didn't mention this last week. I didn't talk about it, but Jacob named the place of the wrestling match. Do you remember that? He named it Peniel. Peniel. Well, what is that? What's the significance? When Hebrew, the, the name or the word penny means face. What is El in Hebrew? God. So the place where he was broken by God, the place where he was beat down and held on to the feet of Jesus, receiving the blessing, Jacob called it the face of God. He saw a glimpse of glory, and this would interpret and inspire what we see in this chapter. Now, before he wrestled with the contentious relationship with Esau, he had to wrestle with God. And I want to point four ways that Jacob's character was significantly impacted and changed that we see in this chapter 33. First of all, Jacob responded with personal self-denial. Personal self-denial. If you'll remember in the last chapter, again, Jacob divided his camps. This is before the wrestling match at the end of the chapter. Jacob divided his camp into two camps. He sent them on over the Jabuk River or stream, and he stayed back on the other side. Before meeting with God, he sent everybody else ahead, and he's, oh, the brave Jacob, I'm going to just take up the rear. That completely changes here in this chapter. After meeting with God, what happens? Look at, the, at verse 3. He himself went on before them. He changes the order. He now is functioning in this self-denial. If, J- if Esau is going to kill anybody, it's going to be me. I'm going first. I'm going to lead the camp. I'm not going to bring up the rear. This is really a sign that grace has laid a hold of Jacob as he's functioning in this self-denial. Next, he demonstrates calm wisdom. There's an incredible change in Jacob's demeanor before and after his wrestling with God. In the last chapter, he's very agitated, and he's trying to process things and plan things. After, 
he's calm. He's walking in wisdom. This strength just permeates his being. Where does that strength come from? It comes from communion with God. Where does calmness and courage in our Christian lives come from? It comes from communion with God. It's a fruit of our communion with the Lord. Thirdly, we see in him authentic humility. Authentic humility. Jacob bowed seven times on his way to Esau as he's limping towards him. Now, this was a customary practice in the ancient Near East of of the time of the patriarchs. It was a courteous way to show respect and to show deference towards someone else. So this is not groveling. We could look at this in in our Western eyes, interpret it as, well, he's just groveling. No, it it was a show of respect and of honor and authentic humility. What a contrast from 20 years before as Jacob is trying to outmaneuver and to elbow everything away from Esau. Here he is showing humility, authentic humility. Even when he insists, look at the language, when he insists that Esau accept the gift of over 550 animals, this is what he says. Please accept my blessing that is brought to you because God has dealt graciously with me and because I have enough. Thus he urged him and he took it. That one word, blessing, ought to jump off the page if you think about the context of their relationship. It's the exact same word that was used in Genesis chapter 27 when he stole, when he swindled the blessing away from his blind father Isaac. And now he comes and he says, please accept my blessing. You see this humility? This transformative humility? These attitudes of Jacob really paved the way for these brothers to be reconciled. And especially this last attitude he demonstrated, genuine affection. Genuine affection. Bowing himself to the ground seven times until he came near to his brother. I mean, you can just see him. Imagine the scene. It's almost as if it's a painting of this bowing brother showing this genuine affection. He just wanted to be close to him. He just desired warm relationship with his twin brother. This is all the fruits of Peniel. It's the fruit of seeing the face of God as he's broken before the Lord. And and how does Esau respond to Jacob's demonstration of humility and denial and affection? Look at verse 4. But Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him and they wept. Does that sentence sound familiar to you, Bible students? We see this almost identical sentence in the Lord's parable of the prodigal son. As he's describing the father, looking in the distance, waiting for the prodigal to go home, come home, how does Jesus describe the father's response in verse 20 of Luke 15? But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. Friends, I don't know if there's a sweeter verse in the Bible for we who have been backslidden with the Lord than to know that our Father is looking for us to run to us to embrace us and to receive us. You've got a limping Jacob and a sprinting Esau reunited and it feels so good. They embrace and they weep two brothers that have been separated for over 20 years and in that moment the revenge The hatred was gone out of Esau's heart. Sure, he'd sharpened his swords with the 400 men to come, but there would be no killing on this day, only forgiveness. And and as these two brothers are reconciled, remarkably, neither one of them bring up any of the past offenses. It's amazing. (laughs) They don't say, okay, yeah, 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 we've embraced, we've hugged, we've kissed, we've wept. We got some things to hammer out here. We got some deals to talk about. You remember what you did 20 years ago? None of that happens. They all knew the offenses. They all knew the pain. Now, I think this can be instructive for us as well. I certainly appreciate much of what happens in counseling situations to try to help others deal with hurts and wounds from the past, but I'm afraid too often we can spend too much time opening up wounds and letting them bleed rather than letting them heal. We can lay everything out on the couch in that counseling situation 
and really not move beyond examining the junk. They forgive. They recognize I've been wounded, I've been hurt, I've experienced wrong, suffered. That's what happens here. God has done exceedingly, abundantly above anything Jacob could hope or imagine. And did you notice Esau's first words that he spoke to Jacob? After they hug and after they embrace, he sees his wives and all the children. And what does he say? Introduce me to your family. Who are all these people, Jacob? And how does Jacob respond? Jacob said, verse 5, the children whom God has graciously given your servant. Jacob, in this passage, attributes everything to God. Here in verse 5, in verse 8, verse 10, verse 11, no less than four times, Jacob says, this is the grace of God. This is the blessing of God. This is the favor of God. Interestingly, Esau never mentions God. Why? Because it's an indication Esau's not a believer. He's not a believer in the one true God. Esau's first question was about the family, but interestingly, Esau's second question was about the lavish gift that he'd received from those five successive servants with all those droves of animals. Look again at verse 8. Esau said, what do you mean by all this company that I met? Speaking of the animals. Jacob answered, to find favor in the sight of my Lord. Now, Middle Eastern etiquette required when someone offered you a gift, you at first reject the gift. That's Middle Eastern etiquette. And that's exactly what Esau does. Jacob says, I've got a lavish gift for you. And the etiquette required, I reject the gift. Etiquette further required for Jacob to offer it again. No, I insist that you take the gift. So this back and forth goes until Esau accepts the gift in full. Now, some have criticized Jacob here, saying, oh, he's just trying to buy off his brother. He's just trying to use this extravagant gift to buy his forgiveness, trying to manipulate again, trying to manage outcomes, knowing Esau's a materialist and I can play on his materialism. But notice what the New Testament says of how we're to deal with our enemies. In Romans 12, the Apostle Paul says, to the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink, for by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil evil with good. The idiom comes from that, kill them with kindness. That's exactly what we're called to do as believers. We're offended, we're hurt, we give gifts. We're wounded, we love. This is the Christ life. That's what it means to be a Christian. We don't grow more cynical. Oh, I knew I could never trust that guy. I knew she was going to do me wrong. We overcome evil through our sacrificial, selfless service to those who've wounded us. Now, our flesh, what does it say? Just the opposite. The old man says, stand up for your rights. You get what's yours. You look out for number one. But Jesus says, someone forces you to walk a mile with them, say, hey, let me go a second mile with you. If someone says, you carry my pack, You say, can I carry it twice as far than what you want? This is the Christ life. This reuniting of Jacob and Esau tells us this, that God's power, God's power can heal fractured relationships. Our elders regularly pray for and intervene in broken relationships, broken marriages, broken families. And that hard, arduous work of walking with people through those situations, it's almost too much for us to bear sometimes. It's hard. It's painful. But we were reminded even this week, God still works miracles. God still performs the miracles of reunification. And so we trust in God. We believe in Him to rebuild and bring back together fractured, deeply wounded families and marriages. Maybe I'm speaking to you this morning. Maybe you have a relationship that's fractured, that's broken, that you've long since determined 
Estrangement is forever. God is a miracle working God. God can mend the hurts. And herein, we see the gospel. You think about these four attitudes we see with Jacob that I mentioned after his wrestling match at the face of God. We see them in Christ. Yes. Self denial. Is there anyone who's displayed such personal self denial for others like Christ? Giving away his life, facing death so we could be reconciled to God? Calm wisdom. Friends, Christ was not frantic, he was settled in his trust. Strength permeated his being. Authentic humility. Jesus humbled himself, took upon the form of a servant that he might mend the brokenness that existed between God and man. In humility, Jesus sacrificed his own body that he might bridge the chasm between us. In genuine affection. Think of what Jesus did and how Jesus loved. There in that final supper, he shared with his disciples as his beloved disciple John is describing it in chapter 13, verse 1 of his epistle, or of his gospel. John says this of Jesus, and having loved them to the end. This is Christ. Genuine affection. Friends, God specializes in mending what is broken and restoring what is fractured. He is the God of reconciliation. That's the first thing we see here. Brothers reconciled. Secondly, we won't spend as much time on these last two points, but number two, brothers released. Brothers released. In verses 12 through 16, they release each other to go their own way. And there's wonderful dialogue going back and forth, curious dialogue. They're offering deference to one another. Esau begins in verse 12 with these words. Let us, you and I, Jacob, journey on our way, and I will go ahead of you. Now, what's he thinking? He's thinking, okay, you're going to come with me back to Edom. I'm settled in Edom. I'm in the land of Seir. I've got flocks and herds and men and servants. You just let's all journey down to my home and we'll settle there. Jacob says, no, I can't travel there right now. Why? Well, this might be an excuse, but it was some truthfulness in it. The children are weary, 500 miles herding the flocks and driving them. If I herd them one more day, they're all going to die. Well, we know that's really not totally true. This is kind of Jacob being Jacob again. But he's still giving this reason. I can't go down with you to Edom. I've got to stay here. And now they've reconciled. They've come together and the relationship's been mended. But now they release one another. They separate from one another. Why? Well, here's the thing. As I mentioned earlier, Esau is not a godly man. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 6 says of Esau that he was an unholy man. He was wicked. Jacob knew, I can't move my family there. To the pagan land of Edom, around my brother who is an unholy, wicked, godless man. Further, he lived in the land of Edom, which was pagan, and it was not where God had told him to go. Where did God tell him to go? to the land of Canaan. Jacob, you're to go to the promised land. That was the command. He did this detour to see Esau because reconciliation was necessary, but for the fulfillment of God's promises to be accomplished, he must go to the promised land. So, brothers are released. They release one another, and these two never see each other again until all the way in chapter 35 when Esau comes to bury their father Isaac, and Esau's only briefly mentioned there. So brothers reconciled, brothers released. Thirdly, brothers resettled. Brothers resettled. The chapter ends by telling us this in verses 16 and 17. So Esau returned that day on his way to Seir, but Jacob journeyed to Succoth and built himself a house and made booths for his livestock. So Esau is at home in Eden. He's at home in the pagan land. Jacob, on the other hand, goes in a different direction. It says he went to Succoth, which literally means booths, and there he made booths. So we don't know if it was named Succoth or he named it Succoth because he built booths there. These are cattle stalls. Now, why did he go there? This is not yet in the land of Canaan. We're not told how long he stayed at Succoth, long enough to build a house and build some cattle stalls. Why did he do that? Why did he 
spend time there. We're really not told. We can, you know, guess. Well, maybe it's true. The, the cattle were weak for the long journey of 500 miles. Maybe this was a fertile grazing area, and he wanted to rebuild and replenish his flocks. Maybe he wanted to go through a, th- a few seasons of, of mating and birthing and mating and birthing. He'd given away most of his cattle to his brother. Let's build up my herds here in Succoth before I go into the promised land. But then finally, verse 18, Jacob makes it there. Look at verse 18. And Jacob came safely to the city of Shechem. Here it is, which is in the land of Canaan. Finally, he's made it to where God has told him to go. Over 20 years, welcome home. (laughs) He's finally home. Through all the difficulties and all the dangers, through the conniving and cheating father-in-law for 20 years in Mesopotamia, through the threat of revenge of his brother Esau, through the replenishing of his flocks, he finally crosses the border, and he's home. He's in the land of Canaan. There at Shechem, what does he do? He buys a parcel of land. He settles his family. But verse 20 tells us the final thing he does. Really, it's the first thing he does. There... He erected an altar and called it El Elohi Israel. And I would point out the significance of Shechem. All the way in Genesis chapter 12, after Abraham had obeyed the call of God, left his home of Ur to go to the land that God would show him, here in Shechem, God met with Abram again. And what did Abraham do? Jacob's grandfather, He built an altar, and he worshiped. And it was here at Shechem. Later, you'll discover in the book of Joshua, this little boy Joseph, who was with this entourage, would eventually, and we'll see in our next series through Genesis, he would become the second in command in all of Egypt. Well, after the Exodus, after they leave Egypt, and they're wandering in the wilderness for 40 years, Moses dies, Joshua is now the general. They have been carrying around Joseph's bones this whole time. When they make it into the promised land, guess what they do? They bring the bones of Joseph, the beloved son of Jacob, of Israel, to Shechem, and they bury him there. But friends, 1,700 years later, here at Shechem, this property that Jacob bought where he dug his well someone else would be a greater Jacob a greater Israel would be at this well and he'd meet with the woman at the well this shady lady from Sychar and what does he say to her in John 4 13 everyone who drinks of this water of this well of Jacob will be thirsty again but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life here at Shechem. Yes. Most importantly, and the immediate context here in chapter 33 of Genesis, Israel, Jacob, built an altar. Canaan is still a pagan land. It still has many false gods. As soon as he buys the property, he builds an altar, a permanent structure for worship and communion with God. And what an what a instruction that is for us, even fathers. As we've seen Jacob's story, I've told you before, he's not the best spiritual leader of the household. But when they arrive back at Canaan, he builds an altar first thing. And I would ask fathers, What does your family altar look like in the pagan land? What have you built for the spiritual formation of your children and your children's children? He builds an altar and he calls it El Elohi Israel, which means the mighty God of Israel. As we close, I want to draw your attention to a phrase that was uttered in this reunification, this reunited meeting. It was uttered by both Esau and and Jacob. And I want to see what it might mean for us today. It was simply this phrase, I have enough. I have enough. First, when Jacob insisted upon Esau to take this lavish gift, look at verse 9 of chapter 33. Here's how Esau responded. I have enough, my brother. Keep what you have for yourself. So he says, I have enough. Now that's a little unusual for the worldly, for the materialistic, to say, oh, I've got enough. The mantra of our 
world and of his world was more. I want more. Amazingly, he says, I have enough. But then Jacob utters the same phrase in verse 11. Please accept my blessing that is brought to you because God has dealt graciously with me and because I have enough. Thus he urged him and he took it. So Esau says, I have enough. I don't need your gift. And Jacob says, I have enough. Take the gift. On the surface, this may not seem significant, but under the surface, it is greatly significant. See, because this word that's translated enough in our English is actually two different Hebrew words. When Esau utters the word, I have enough, it's the Hebrew word rav, which means plenty, sufficient, even abounding. So he's saying, Jacob, I got plenty of stuff. Jacob, I I have sufficient herds and flocks. But the Hebrew word for enough in verse 11 that Jacob uses is the Hebrew word kol, transliterated K-O-L-E. What that word means is everything, all, totality, all things. You see the difference? What's Jacob saying? Esau, you may have plenty of goods, plenty of possessions, but I have El Elohi Israel, which means I have all. I have the totality. I have completion. I need nothing else. And I wonder if we've said that in this world in which we live, where we're always moving and manipulating, trying to get more. Or maybe we've gotten our more and say, okay, now I have plenty. And we need to get to where Jacob was. I have enough. Jesus, you are enough. And that leads to my last thought. Only those who by grace have come to know the one true God can say with assurance, I have enough. I have enough.